good morning again uh, let's get started so yeah yesterday the problem the homework problem that i gave in the last class uh, it looks like around 50% of the class is able to do and uh, the rest of the 50% have a bit of a trouble so yeah it's all right so it's good we will uh, revisit those ideas solve those problems in today's class and uh, i am thinking that every class i will give a problem which uh, you can try uh, this is apart from the homework problems okay so one important resource that i would like you to take a look at is uh, i posted this on the e learn there is a handout called as uh, essential c there is a handout called as essential c which is from stanford university and if you read this one it will pretty much uh, summarize uh, everything that you need regarding c programming language not necessarily computational thinking and uh, it also says like for example if you see there are this uh, handout is uh, 45 pages in length so pretty much this is a very concise complete summary of the c programming language so whenever you get a doubt or you should try to ask we discuss ideas in the class you should try to refer to this uh, handout along with the textbook this is a really good handout you should read and uh, like for example at this point in time in the next uh, let's say by uh, at this point in time you should i want you to read section 1 properly read section 1 properly read section 1 uh, line by line take time read and uh, understand this next is uh, section 2 so this section 1 and section 2 you should finish reading by uh, end of uh, next week i would say okay by end of next week i would say along with the the chapters that we have in the textbook so reading is an important thing a habit that you should develop don't keep searching for stuff on internet because you don't get a complete picture when you read the stuff on internet so what you you need to develop a complete picture and when you have some doubt in the complete picture you can go and look at uh, google something and find out but otherwise don't try to learn ideas uh, no by searching online all the time because you don't get a complete picture so the task for you the task for you is uh, section 2 and section 1 you should read completely uh yeah so so now let's go to uh let's go to this is posted on the elearn website it is already posted on the elearn website in the last class we have seen two important constructs one is uh, the go to statement the other is the if then else uh, statement these are the two important constructs that we have seen in the last class i would like to repeat uh, those ideas the review the if statement and uh, the go to statement and after that uh, we will solve the problems that uh, i gave as homework in the last class and also yeah i think that would be it for today's session i think that's what we will be able to do today but one important thing that you will learn today is uh, how to use uh, the debugger tool uh, called as gd that's what you will learn in today's class all right let's get started so let's take uh, this program extremely simple program stripe.c 
so here so in all the programs that you have seen except if you leave the uh, yes. so what do you do so like for example if you have in type so there is a uh, data type called as there's uh, uh, the, we are declaring a variable i and we are declaring its type as uh, integer i so one thing again, if you quickly want to know what are all the data types that are available in uh, C programming language, you know, there are what are called as primitive data types and what are called as user defined data types. So if you want to quickly understand uh, what are all the uh, data types that are available for uh, to hold integers, to hold integers, you can see, like, for example, if you go and check in this handout, you can see there is what is called as a short integer and there is an integer and there is a long integer. And then you can also see that there is unsigned and signed. You can see that there is unsigned and signed. So this particular idea we have discussed uh, in the last class and car uh, is uh, not exactly an integer data type, but um, yeah, but uh, what happens is uh, the ASCII representation of characters will be stored if we have something like CARC. So anyway, so leave this aside. The point is uh, that I'm trying to make is uh, when you get a doubt, just take this as a kind of a reference manual so that you can quickly go and check uh, uh, what uh, so, so what uh, C language actually says about uh, the particular question that you have in mind. So I'm just giving an example on how you can use this as a reference. Good. So now let's go back. So here you have, let's say you have i is equal to, you can say i is equal to zero, i is equal to i plus one, or you can have something like j is equal to two star i. So what is this, uh, what is the property of the sequence of code? The property of the sequence of code uh, is uh, the instruction on line seven gets executed and then on the instruction afterwards gets executed and the instruction afterwards gets executed, so on and so forth. That is the control is going uh, one statement after another in a linear direction, in a linear forward direction. So I will show you how to use GDB today. GDB is an interesting tool. So GCC straight.c. Ah, let me use, uh, void GCC straight .c. right? And uh, so if I execute this, nothing comes out because we are not taking any input or output. We are just uh, executing it. So let's say we want to use, uh, I'll show you, remember this option GCC minus G compiler flag uh, straight dots. We compile it using this GCC minus G straight dots. And then we say we use uh, GDB is the tool. So we say GDB a dot out. Great. And then uh, you use uh, there is a command called as TUI enable. And then we use what is called as a breakpoint, B-R-E-A-K, break point me. And then we tell GDB to run the program. So when we tell GDB to run the program, it starts executing, but then we have set a breakpoint at main. So what happens is at the beginning of the function main, the no, GDB stops there. So I'll say run. So now what happens is at the beginning of the function main, the program stopped executing. What is the first instruction of mean? That is i is equal to zero. That is the instruction that uh, we are supposed to execute next. So we will say next. So after we execute next, you will see that uh, no, the statement on line seven got executed. So after the statement on line seven got executed, what is the value of i? What is the value of i? It is equal to zero, right? It's uh, simple. So print 
pi that is uh, zero. So now let's say now the next statement that we have to execute is the statement on line uh, uh, nine. So we say next. So what will be the value of i? It is equal to what? It is equal to one, right? Yeah. Good. So print i. So you get one. So now, so again, uh, the statement on line 11 needs to be executed. So we say next. So when we do next, so the statement on line 11 got executed. And if we print j, we'll get uh, uh, j is equal to. And then when we do next, then we are out of the function main and the program finished executing. Are you all with me on how this is working? How GDB is working? It's a tool. GDB is a debugger tool. It's a very, very important tool which helps you in debugging programs. Are you with me on this tool, guys? Did you see how it is working? Yeah. So let me go back again. So, so you have to compile your program using GCC minus G. Uh, minus Y is to generate, uh, give a name to the executable. But minus G is to it stores some information in the generated executable so that the GDB can, uh, like for example, uh, uh, the source code uh, is available uh, for the debugger so that it can have a map between the generated instructions and the source code. So GCC minus G, this is now the way to do it is GDB A dot out. So let's say, you, if you are compiling your program and generating, you are storing the executable in uh, the, when you don't use anything, uh, you know, like uh, we can use. So, uh, so now we are just storing the generated executable in uh, the file named straight, okay, GCC minus G straight dot C uh, minus straight. This is what we are doing. And then we say GDB not A dot out. We have to use GDB straight. Are you all with me here? Are you all with me? So I hope you are able to. If you don't use minus G, you cannot uh, debug it. It will be hard. So this is this minus O tells instead of writing the executable in A dot out, write it in the file straight. And then we use the command GDB straight. So, so now if I just say run, the program executes and comes out. You see nothing. So you, I said run, the program executed and it came out. So nothing, you don't see anything. It's like running the program as usual. But I want the program to stop at the beginning of main. So when I say break main, so either I can use B or B R E A K. So both instead of using break main, we can use B space main. That is also fine. So when you set a break point, so you can see the message here. There is a first, the first break point is set on line seven of the program of the source code file straight.c. If you go here, line seven contains the first instruction of main. So the first breakpoint, breakpoint means when you run the program, the program will, before executing that instruction, uh, GDB stops there, GDB stops there. So when I said break main, so I used a function name as the breakpoint, then what it is saying is uh, uh, the breakpoint is set on line seven uh, of the file straight.c. So when you run the program, the uh, what happens is uh, you know uh, before uh, executing the statement on line seven, GDB stops and gives control to us. We can put breakpoint anywhere actually. We can even give line numbers directly. We can say break uh, on line numbers eight or break on line number nine or 
wherever we can put a break point it is possible line 5 is not an executable because we are just telling uh, it, it is possible to keep on line number 5 but it doesn't mean anything because all we are telling is on line number 5 we are the, line number 5 doesn't get executed we are giving information to the compiler that we are using two variables i and j and they are of type integer it is an information we are giving to the compiler it's not uh, we don't execute it uh, uh, per se okay it's a good question i want you to understand this the la the line which is highlighted is not executed it okay now let's do run so now when you do run what happens is uh, uh, the program started running and then gdb prints the message that the next instruction that it is about to execute is on line number 7 and what is the statement on line number 7 it is showing so you can do debugging this way and then if i say next then what happens is the statement on line 7 got executed and the next instruction that needs to be executed is uh, the statement on line 9 and i can just press enter when we press enter whatever the previous instruction that is the next instruction in this case gets executed so next what is the next instruction so so when uh, i is equal to i plus 1 got executed and the next instruction we are uh, is uh, j is equal to 2 star so this is one way of doing debugging but you know like um, uh what so a better way is uh, we can use uh, a graphical user interface tui is a terminal user interface i guess so which makes it easier for us to see what is happening in the program so when i when we do run now you can see line 7 is highlighted are you with me here so does it mean line 7 is executed or that need, needs to be executed yeah line 7 needs to be executed it's not yet executed so now let's look at print i print j so in this particular case the variables i and j they are initialized to 0 but they can contain any garbage values there is no necessity for i in variables i and j to be equal to 0 because we didn't initialize them uh, yet so now after we now we use the next instruction we can do debugging in visual studio code but for the time being i would like you to use gdb so now we we executed next so now uh, the statement on line 7 got executed and statement on line 9 needs to be executed i hope you are with me here and then we do a next so the important advantage in uh, uh, in gdb is uh, we can examine Oh, there are a lot more variables. If you don't worry, so we can, uh, so we can, for example, print i. What is the, if you print j? J is the statement on line eleven is not executed. Now debugging means this is what. So you want to understand, trace the program. and see what is happening in the program so that you will figure out what is working and what is not working that's all debugging means there is a bug in the code so you wrote a program you compile the program it is not working you don't know what is happening so you want to go step by step and see what is happening in the programs that you have written how did you do debugging so far or the programs those of you who tried the program yesterday how did you do the debugging most of the time you use printf to see what is happening that's true 
Exactly. So you use printf at stages where there are doubts, and then you try to debug. So that is kind of all right for some programs, but uh, some uh, bugs, they are harder to catch using that approach. And uh, so GDB is a very powerful approach to do that. So now let's execute the statement on line 11. So next, and uh, so now line 11 got executed. And if I print J, we see that the value of uh, J is equal to two. Are you all with me here so far? Today's session, good. Okay. So you can, I think you can use quit to quit from GDB or out from GDB. So now, so let's say at the end of statement 12, I have a statement uh, go to uh, L1. And uh, no. so now when, when we run this program, what happens? What happens when we run this program? It's it goes on an infinite loop. Good question. Good good answer. Good answer, guys. So let's compile this program. GCC minus G, straight dot C, uh, GDB. Uh, let me use the same thing. Straight GDB G dot out break main run the ui enable so so you execute the instruction on line 8 and then uh, you execute the instruction on line 11 you execute the instruction uh, on uh, i did gdb straight only i uh, and then uh, you execute the instruction on line 13 so this is what I want you to understand. So what is the semantics of go to L1? That is you go to a statement which is attached to the label L1. So now if I say, so now you are not seeing the next statement, the next on the screen, because I'm just pressing enter. Whenever I press enter, whatever the GDB command that we have given before that gets repeated. So next is the GDB command that we have given before and that gets repeated. So now when we press enter, so control will go back to statement 11 and uh, statement 11 is uh, because uh, the label L1 is associated with the statement 11 uh, uh, in the program. Are you with me here? Are you all with me here? So you keep uh, pressing enter, you keep pressing enter like this keep going forever. This program enters an infinite loop. Are you happy? This is fundamental idea, guys. So if you understand this, then, uh, you know, then, then you are cool. Very good. No, there is... Uh, Enter is equal to the last command, whatever the last command uh, that we have. Let's say, for example, if I use print i, print i is the last command, right? If I press enter, then what is happening is print i get, got executed again. If I press enter again, print i got executed again. So when I press enter, whatever the last command that is given, it gets uh, repeated. Shall I proceed further, if you're all good so far? We have iterated 10 times. That's the reason i is equal to 
10. So like for example, if I execute it, and then if I do print type, it will be equal to 11. Okay, so the next question is, how do we break from this loop? Let's say we want to iterate for, uh, uh, so Sanyam, you should look at it before I explain a couple of times. So break main, so all break main does is, so when you run the program, the GDB stops at the first instruction of main, which is uh, the statement on line eight. So if I, so now I want to uh, terminate this program after we iterate for uh, 10 times, let's say. So we use this if statement, I, if I equal to equal to 10, uh, then what should we do? What can we put here? Go to end. This is where. Does it make sense? So now at this point, I want to explain the semantics of uh, I, the semantics of the if statement. So I will take this uh, manual. I want you to understand, uh, uh, yeah, so, so far you have used, you have seen arithmetic operations, expressions involving arithmetic operators. Expressions involving arithmetic operators. Let's see, yeah. So now you will see uh, expressions involving, expressions involving uh, relational operators. What are the arithmetic operators that you have? The arithmetic operators that you have so arithmetic operators arithmetic operators that we have uh, uh, like um, yeah so so arithmetic operators i'm just writing it here on the, as a side note arithmetic operators I'm not making an exhaustive list like you know, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and the increment operator and decrement operator. These are all arithmetic operators. And then now we have uh, an equal to is an assignment operator. And we have the relational operators here. Uh, so, the, so the relational operators, they work on uh, integers or floating point numbers. And they return either a zero or one as the Boolean value. Like for example, uh, if you write a statement such as A equal to B, and if the, the two variables A and B are uh, equal, then a value one, so there are two possibilities. So this is yes or no. If this is yes, the value written by this uh, expression, relational, uh, this uh, conditional expression, uh, so it will be one, otherwise it will be equal to zero. Yeah, I don't mean to be exhaustive in this arithmetic operator list. I'm just giving an indication what are all the arithmetic operators. Let's write modulo also. Modulo is not, we cannot use modulo on floating point numbers. Similarly, you can, uh, so if A is not equal to B, so again, so that means the contents of variable A and contents of variable B, if they are not equal to each other, okay, yes, then it returns one, otherwise it equals to zero. Similarly, greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, so these are all self-explanatory. We usually use relational operators in, um, so before in, in, if, in if statements. So, so what we do is uh, if some condition, if some expression, actually this is not even condition, if some expression, then uh, we have some uh, body of the statement. So I will uh, review the, the, the what, what do you say? 
the syntax of if statement, syntax and semantics of if statement in a moment. But one thing you should understand is uh, if you, instead of using equal to equal to, if you use equal to, okay, this is the pitfall. If you do something like A equal to B, then uh, you're not checking whether A is equal to B, you're assigning B to A. Sometimes this will kind of get into trouble. If you see the statement here, if X is equal to three, what happens is, uh, will this condition turns out to be true or false? This condition turns out to be true because in C, this expression, if it turns, if it is a non-zero value, then any non-zero value is true and uh, false is uh, only zero. So here, if you see this expression, this assignment expression, uh, this assignment expression X is equal to three, so, you know, X is equal to three, it is an assignment expression and the value of this whole expression is three. This is bit of a tricky thing to understand because uh, the, so there are two things that happen here when we do X is equal to three. One is the way the contents of the variable X will be assigned uh, the value three. The second is this whole expression returns a value three, but usually that value gets ignored because on a single line, when we just use, say, have the statement i is equal to one, uh, the whole uh, expression statement, it returns one, but we ignore it, we don't use it. But the second thing that happens is the contents of the variable i gets changed. It will be made equal to one. So I, I will revisit this idea in a moment. So let's go down and see, I want to use this manual and explain so that it will be easy for you to read this manual later on. Yeah. So I want you to uh, pay attention to this. What is the format of an if statement? So if expression a statement. This statement, uh, so you know, when you talk of statements, there are uh, simple statements and uh, block statements. So like, for example, it is possible for us, so if you have something like, uh, no, i is equal to one, it can be one statement, but it is possible for us to group blocks of statements using left and right uh, parentheses. Okay. So this whole thing, this using not parentheses, these are called as left uh, flower bracket and right flower bracket. The whole thing, this becomes what is called as a block statement. So if you see the if statements uh, syntax, uh, if you see if statement syntax, so if if expression uh, followed by a statement, this statement can be a single statement or it can be a block statement. This statement can be a single statement or a block statement. And there are two forms of if. Of if. One is uh, the only if statement with no else and other is if statement with else. So these are the two forms of if, form one without else and form two with else. And if you see the body of the if statement, if or else part, they can be block statements or simple statements that is only one statement. And the important thing here is this expression can be, it need not be relational expression that is an expression involving, you know, A greater than or equal to B, it can be any expression. Uh, and if the value of the expression turns out to be non-zero, then it is true. And if the value of the expression is zero, then it is false. Are you all with me here so far? Great. Uh, so one more thing you should, uh, how do we, so many times uh, you want to uh, check multiple things. Uh, so with there you use logical operators. Like for example, you want to check whether, uh, you know, uh, the a variable A lies between, you want to check whether a variable A is lies between uh, zero to 10. This is what you want to check. So how do you check? You check if, uh, so you kind of, the expression which checks is 
zero is uh, less than or equal to a. So this is one, and then you use and operator, and then you check if a is less than ten. So you don't have, you cannot write a condition expression like this. So you have to split it into two and write like this. So in terms of tree representation, what happens is this becomes zero less than or equal to a, and this is a less than or equal to ten. So let's say if a is equal to four, if a is equal to four, this evaluates to true. Let's say if a is equal to four, uh, yeah, let's assume a is equal to four. Then what happens is this evaluates to true, and this evaluates uh, this also evaluates to true, and when if, since both are true, this also evaluates to true. Are you with me here? How and and works, but let's say if a is equal to uh, minus one, yeah, let's say if a is equal to minus one. So if a is equal to, if so, yeah, let's say a is equal to minus four. What's the big deal? If when a is equal to minus four, then what happens is, uh, you know, uh, so this uh, zero is less than this turns out to be false, and this turns out to be true because minus four is, is less than ten. But false ended with the true, it is false. Yeah, so there is a good point here. In C, there is what is called as a short circuit evaluation. So here, since uh, the first statement turns out to be false, uh, you know, then compiler immediately knows that there is no point in uh, uh, evaluating the right subtree because false ended with anything true or false is still false. So this tree will not be executed. Okay, so good point. So this part, this part will not be executed because uh, false ended with uh, whatever it is true or false, it is still false. So this this particular thing it will not be executed when uh, a is equal to minus four. I hope you are all tagging along with me so far. And uh, how about uh, uh, so? There is this question: Can we use the return value one or zero anywhere? You cannot use the return value one or zero because I think it's not guaranteed. Usually, if it is true, some non-zero value will be returned. If it is false, zero value will be returned. So it's better not to use those values. So how about this? If it is zero less than or equal to, yeah. Let's try to do the same, but with uh, the R operator. Are you good here? So now, when a is equal to four, what happens? So naturally, this will be true. This will be true. This the whole thing will be true. So when a is equal to four, what actually happens is this is true, right? Since this is true, there is no necessity to execute this part, the second tree. If this is true, there is no necessity to execute the second part because true or with anything, it is true. So the right way to represent this is, let's say there are two things here. So a1, a2. This is uh, what is called as a truth table. We say for R, and this is and. So this is true, 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 false, false, true, false, false. So for R, if one of the things is true, it will be true, and for and, if one of the things is false. It will be false, and then there is a negation operator you can see here. So this one is very simple. So if it is uh, true, false, 
if you apply negation of this, this will be false and true. Are you with me here? These three things. And there is this idea of short circuit evaluation. What is short circuit? Uh, like for example, if A is equal to four, then this is true, right? If this is true, true or with whatever it is, it is true. So the compiler knows, so this part wouldn't be executed at all if A is equal to four. But on the contrary, if A is equal to minus four, uh, then this turns out to be false. And because of that, the second part will be executed. So this is the summary. Uh, and uh, so there is this good question. So let's say there is one expression E1 Anded with expression e2, odd with expression e3. So we, I think, the, in terms of this depends upon the precedence. In terms of the precedence, I think uh, uh, so. It depends upon how things work out. But if I am right, what happens is uh, uh, the particle. The, if you draw the expression tree, it looks like this. So now when you draw the expression tree, so now once we draw this, now you can explain what happens. If this is true, will this be executed? The second part E2 will be executed. Yes or no, if this is true, right? Yeah, it will be executed because unless this is true, but on the contrary, if this is false, will the second part be executed? No, as simple as that. And now if, you, if, if this is true, then will E3 be executed? No. No, if this is true, E3 will not be executed because true or with whatever it is, it is true. So you're all good here, right? So shall we move on? If you are doing good here. Good question, Narayana. Okay, good. Now let's move on. So, yeah. See, good. Some many times I don't remember the precedence uh, things. So you should refer to the book and see. Yeah. Okay, good. So let's go back to the program that we are working with. So this is the program that we are working with. Uh, so we compile this, we come out of this and we write this code, compile this code GCC minus G. Yeah, okay. So here I think at the end, we need to put a null statement. Otherwise uh, it wouldn't work. Yeah, now it works. See on line number 20, I put a null statement. So GDB uh, straight. So Sanyam, you pay attention here. You ask the question, what does break main does? So when you put a break main here, then uh, no break point is set on line number eight of the function main. That is the first executable statement of the function. That's where the breakpoint gets set. And TUI enable, and you say run. So now since the breakpoint is on line number eight, so uh, line number eight gets uh, executed. It's, it's set to be executed. Okay, next, next. If i is equal to 10, is this true? I is equal to this condition is false. So the, the line statement on line 14 will not be executed. You come out of it, line 17, line 19 gets executed, and then you go back again to line 11.
i think you should uh, stop worrying about you no know, that uh, or and 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 all those things you just have to refer to the textbook which clear which specifies the rules you should need you need to get the big picture and for the details you need to look at the book or the manuals to see exactly the semantics and whenever you have a doubt on these things in programs uh, try to simplify them so that it becomes easy for you to understand does it make sense whenever you have this doubt if i do these things uh, what exactly happens if you are not sure write a simpler form and make it uh, easier for you to understand and later on when someone is using your code and building on your code it will be easy on them also to understand what you are trying to do so you it, it keeps going like this it keeps uh, going like this and uh, let's see what shall you I just kept a watch eye so that uh, whenever the value of i changes, it automatically prints it. Yeah, the new value of i is uh, six, seven, so the current value of i is nine. As you can see, that uh, no, that new value is equal to nine. So this condition will still be false. You come out. And you come here, and now i is equal to ten. What happens since i is equal to ten? Where will the control go to? Line fourteen, not to end. No, no, you should not say end. The control transfers to line fourteen in the block statement. End is wrong, guys. End is it doesn't go to end. It goes to line fourteen, and on line fourteen. There is a go to statement which transfers control to line twenty. That is the end. Did you completely understand this program? You are all happy now. You understand how to use GDB. You understand how if statements work. You understand how go to works, and you understand how to use the watch point. Using watch point is also very important. So because otherwise, every time you have to print what is the current value of i. did you notice that if I, if i didn't keep a uh, watch point uh, on uh, watch on i then uh, we have to we don't know like whether the value of i is equal to 9 or 8 or 10 we have to manually keep track of that so instead we just said watch i so because of that whenever the value of i gets changed it gets printed so we know where we are in the loop we cannot edit the code in gdb it's not possible so now with this current understanding you should be able to actually you know write the solve the problems that uh, i gave in the last class with a great uh, amount of ease i would say yeah so now let's try to solve the problems from the last uh, so what is the first problem from the let's take the simplest problem i will take uh, yeah maybe even uh, more than that i'll just use uh, uh, let's say i want to compute the sum of first n numbers this is uh, compute sigma what the problem that we would like to solve is this sigma i is equal to 1 to n i this is what we would like to solve this is much more easier than the problem that we have taken up uh, last class as such so print f enter n scan f uh you know percent d and percent n or do we write the program so we want to accumulate uh, so so i should go from 1 to n so we make i is equal to uh, 1 and then we have a variable sum the initial value of the variable sum is equal to 
initial value of so now what we do is uh, we check if uh, so what is the condition we should be checking here if i is greater than or equal greater than uh, n then you should go to n if i is greater than n we should go to n and actually in order to make my point clear we don't need a block statement here because there is only one statement uh, in it. so if i is greater than n go to end and what do we do at the end so we at the end we say sum of uh, first percent d numbers this percent d slash n. And what is the statement on line 18? What is the statement on line 18? Sum plus is equal to i. So you know on line 18, sum plus is equal to, this is nothing but sum is equal to sum plus. This, this is nothing but sum is equal to sum plus i. This is a shorthand for it. And again, you go back to huh, i is equal to i plus 1. Thank you, Lavisha. Yeah, finally, you have to do i is equal to i plus 1. You're all good? Does it make sense, this whole program? Will it work? Are you all happy with this code? Any problem you see? Anything amiss? You don't need an else. So if, if condition is true, then uh, you go to the end. Otherwise, the statement on line 17 gets executed or line 18 gets executed. So you don't need an else here in this particular program. We don't need a semicolon after end. We need it only uh, when there are no statements at all there. In the previous case, we have kept semicolon because there is no print of statement there. So we just put a semicolon meaning null statement. It seems that is a requirement of the C language. That's a language issue. There's nothing to do with computational thinking per se. So I want you to have this distinction in your mind. What is a language issue and what is a you know real problem? Uh, so the, what is computational thinking? What is the algorithm? What is the logic versus the language issue? So here, like for example, in straight.c, I kept a semicolon on line 20 because there is no statement and C language requires that uh, uh, at least some statement should be there. And it seems if we have uh, uh, just put semicolon, it is what is called as a null statement. This is what is called as a null statement. So this is a language issue. This is a language nuance, C language nuance. Nothing to do with computational thinking per se. All right. So now let's uh, compile this program, GCC sum n dot c dot a dot out five the sum of first five numbers is 15. you're all good you understand how this works right is 55. So now let's try to, uh, yeah, so now let's try to do a slightly little bit more complex problem that is max.c.
okay let me actually remove all this yeah maybe i don't uh, so what we do is we use uh, i don't uh, let me use uh, current number let me use a variable called as current number so yeah so let's say uh, we do this if scanf uh, percent d and percent current uh, underscore number uh, is equal to is not equal to end of file uh, if it is equal to end of file you you go to end otherwise printf entered number is percent d so i have to see actually whether this works uh, current number let's see what happens All right, are you all with me here so far? I just want to check one thing about scanf. Yeah, if you see scanf written value, the value end of file is returned if the end of input is reached before either the first successful conversion or a matching failure occurs. Yeah, so, so end of file, it's a very good way of, uh, yeah, so end of file is a macro, it is defined. You can use end of file to kind of say, you know, uh, we will see what happens, okay, I'll tell you. Let's, let's keep going. So this is a way to kind of when you, I want you to read the man page of scanf and try to understand and you look for slash EOF and you'll understand the return value. So what scanf returns is the number of values it successfully read and it returns an end of file symbol uh, uh, or, or a matching failure occurs. Okay, yeah, let's see what, let's see what happens. Good. Great. So what is the program that we are, uh, So GCC, so the GCC max.c dot a dot out. So 10, ah, so n number, let me do one thing, I'll put I'll take 10 more minutes and finish this. Maybe by 11.15, I will conclude today's lecture, okay? So 10, this is just setting up the stage for you. And then in order to finish this, I can just press control D once I enter the list of numbers. Or this also kind of works if we enter something like, for example, if I enter, what if I enter D? Oh, <laughs> interesting. So there is some some uh, some cool stuff happening. So I will not uh, get uh, get in there. But in order to terminate the list of numbers, if you just press Control D, then what happens is uh, you know you come out of uh, this condition will be true. Uh, 
becomes true and uh, the statement on line nine gets executed and go to line 50. Are you with me here? Control C terminates the program and control D is uh, kind of end of file symbol, if you, you can think of that way. Control C terminates your program. Are you all with me so far? This part, at least this much logic, are you with me? All we are trying to do is we are trying to read a number and in order to terminate the input, yeah, end of file, we will revisit it uh, maybe a bit later. Uh, uh, an alternate way to take care of it instead of end of file is, uh, this is one way of doing it, but I will tell you a different way, but I will tell you a different way, which is more easier for you to understand at this point in time. Can you not write the code here, guys? It's who, who did this? This is Hardik. You're missing the point. There is a lecture that is going on. Yeah, so Pradham, I will explain it in the next class. It's a, actually, maybe I'll give it as a challenge problem at the end of today's uh, so what if instead of doing this, we will do, uh, if it is not equal to one, go to n. Are you with me on line 12? Now forget about the previous code where we are using end of file, because uh, I will maybe explain it in the next class, uh, or I will give it as a challenge problem also to you. But can you understand why this should work, line 12, 113? What is the return value of scanf? What is the return value of scanf? The number of things it successfully read, the number of inputs it successfully read, not zero or one. In this particular case, if it reads uh, an integer successfully, it returns one. And if it is not able to read an integer successfully, it returns a value other than one. In this case, in that case, it will give a zero. Okay, let's do this. Control C, GCC, max dot C. So now 10, 20, 30. So minus one, zero, whatever it is, it is just reading. But let's say if, it, I, if I enter A, then what happens is, Scanf tries to read uh, an integer from the keyboard buffer and it encounters A and it knows that it cannot uh, map A to an integer and so it returns failure that uh, saying that I am not able to return any integer and in, in fact it returns zero because uh, it's not able to return any, uh, uh, it, it's not able to read a integer from the keyboard buffer. In which case we go to the end. Does it make sense? Are you with me here? So now it works with control D also it works. So if I press control D, control D also works because control D also scanf cannot translate control D to an integer. So on line number 12, it returns a zero. And when it returns a zero, we go to the end. I hope you're all with me here. Everyone with me here? Happy? If, if someone has a problem, you can send me a message. Uh, it can map, but it's not the right thing to do. Just privately, if you are if you are not sure, you can send me a message privately also. All right. So now, how do we compute? Uh, when we give a as input in the keyboard buffer, you should have understood uh, in the in the discussion on scanner. So when A is, this is your keyboard buffer, and if A is present in the keyboard buffer, then what happens is uh, uh, scanf says, you know what, uh, this I cannot, uh, I need a digit to be able to, uh, so if it is something like one, two, no? 
four, then scanf will be able to map this into an integer. But if it sees a, then it knows that it cannot map it into an integer. So it returns uh, it it comes out scanf comes out of uh, without reading in any integer in this particular case. And it returns a zero because it's not able to read even one integer from the keyboard block. So like, for example, I think you should have read it uh, before, but let's say if it is something like this, percent D, percent D, uh, ampersand N1, ampersand N2, and if the keyboard buffer contains this, this is one, 10, uh, this is space and then two, three. So in this particular case, what does scanf written? Let me ask, uh, let's check how you are doing on this. What does scanf written? Scanf returns two in this particular case. And on the contrary, if it is like this, no, sorry, the scale, I drew them. And if it is A, what does scanf written? In this case, it returns one because it is able to read 10 into N1, but it is not, uh, it's, but here there is no, nothing there. No, nothing there means A is present and it cannot uh, translate it into an integer. So it uh, returns one. Because this one gets mapped to N1, but this one, it cannot be translated to N, cannot be converted to an integer. So this causes a problem because of that, it returns one. If carry is used, then it returns. Uh, if percent C is used, then it's a different story. Let's not worry about this is white space. This, uh, this is white space. And the contrary, if you have like this, in this case, what happens? What will scan have written? It returns zero. Are you all with me here? I hope you're all with me, okay? So that's the logic that we have used. See, this is the thing. So the computational thinking versus what uh, C language does. So these are all C language nuances. When you go to a different programming language, these things will change and you, you may not have to worry about these things. So there are language nuances and there are computational thinking. All you want to do here is you want to read an integer, that's all, no? Or you should know if it's not an integer, whatever that is being there. So now, uh, so what should we do? Uh, how do we check here? It's, uh, yeah, so now this is not what we want to do. We want to know if it is, uh, I want to use, so we want to have an initial estimate of uh, the, we want to we want to have an initial estimate of uh, uh, maximum. So when we are entering here, uh, so let's say our first estimate of maximum is something, and then uh, we keep improving that estimate. But the only problem is before seeing any input, let's say if the sequence is this, we want to maintain. Uh, sorry, we want to maintain in a variable max, in a variable max, the current estimate of uh, the input. And the input is this 12, 32, minus 1, 42, et cetera. But before we see the input at all, what should be the current estimate of the max? After we see 12, we can say the current estimate of uh, no, max is uh, 12. But, uh, but, uh, but if that's not the case, before we see, what should be the initial estimate of max? So that's a small problem that we have to solve. And the way we are going to solve this problem is by using, uh, I'm introducing a new data type now, which is called as bool, bool flag. This is present in std bool.h. So if you have to uh, use, uh, the bool thing, then you have to include file uh, std bool. And we will see initially, uh, 
yeah so if bool is equal to true right and then so here what we do is uh, if uh, flag is equal to true yeah let me in order to make it uh, maybe init underscore flag if initial flag is equal to true what we do is uh, we have something like uh, max is equal to current underscore max. and then we say init underscore flag is equal to false And what should be present in the else part? Now we are seeing uh, a uh, nested uh, if statement. So instead of using a nested if statement, we will use a different uh, operator called as a ternary operator. So we will say max is equal to if the current number is greater than max, then current number is the max. Otherwise, max is the current number. Are you with me here? On line 22, this is what again I want you to go back to this document and show you the ternary operator. So the conditional, there is what is called as a ternary operator. What is it or uh, this particular statement, conditional expression statement, where this is of this form expression one expression two and expression three if this expression evaluates to a non-zero value then it is true in which case the value of this whole expression is expression two and if this expression evaluates to a zero value which is false then the value of this whole expression is uh, expression three in other words this is equivalent to this is equivalent to if uh, even if e1, uh, this is like uh, e2, else uh, e3. So this, if you think of this as e1, e2, e3. So this is equivalent to this, uh, but many times, you know, uh, it's uh, instead of writing a full-fledged if statement, we might as well uh, write a small statement here, small shorthand statement using this uh, code. So if you want to see here, let me clear this screen. So an alternate way of doing it is if uh, current number is greater than max, then do this. Max is equal to uh, current number. So you can even uh, so you can so there are two ways of doing it so one way of doing it use using line number 25 the other way of doing it is uh, what we have on uh, line number uh, uh, line numbers 22 to 24 this is what is called as a nested if statement so we have a statement if statement in the else part of the uh, if statement are you with me here do you understand the 25 and uh, line numbers 22 to 24? I hope all of you are with me. Can you send me a message privately if it's not clear? You can see the line number 25 right now I have commented it, but what it is is uh, line number 25. So if this, this is one expression, if this expression is true, if this expression is true, if this expression is true, then the value that is returned, the, the value that will be assigned to max will be uh, current underscore number. Yes or no? Because we are improving the current estimate. But if it is false, then uh, no, the, this, the, the one that is after this colon, uh, because the, the current estimate, the max is not going to improve, so we say max is equal to max. It's kind of redundant. Does it make sense? Does what is there on line number 25 make sense? 
you see a new number and you just compare the current number with the estimate of the max. If the current number is greater than the estimate, our current estimate of the max, you improve the estimate, otherwise the same thing remains. On line number 22 uh, to 24, this is actually, we don't even need this thing. Uh, we can, uh, you know, it's very simple here. Let's, uh, uh, so on uh, the, an alternate approach is you just check if current number is greater than max. Then if that is the case, then you say max is equal to current number. Line number 22 to 23, is it clear to you? You're all good on line number 22 to 23. I hope it is. Uh, and the question is, what is the purpose of init underscore flag? The purpose of init underscore flag is when we read the first the number for the first time, there is no current estimate of max, right? Yes or no? On line number 17, when we are when we are when we read the first input, we don't have a current estimate of the max. So in order to understand that we don't have a current estimate of max, we are using this flag. That is, hey, we are in the initial stage. So init underscore flag is equal to true. And we just take whatever the number that we read, we make it the current estimate of the max. And from then onwards, the story changes. It's the next number uh, we read, we want, uh, we have a current estimate of the max and we keep comparing it, the same with it. So that is the purpose of the init underscore flag. I hope you're all with me here. We don't init underscore flag. It is we initialize it to true. So we don't need to write it to true on line number 17. Line number 19 means it is what it is. No, init underscore flag is now changed to false. False, true and false, they are like uh, true and false are constants that are defined in uh, std bool under dot h file. So we can use true and false. No, what do you mean? What if maximum? I didn't get, uh, yeah, this is same as uh, init underscore flag. It is same as equal to equal to true. It's, uh, it's not actually the same as equal to equal to true because if init underscore flag is equal to false, then, uh, you know, yeah, it will return false. Okay, this is good. We don't need to use bool. You, instead of using init underscore flag is equal to as a bool, you can as well use something like, you know, int flag is equal to zero. And then you kind of, uh, you know, if flag is equal to zero, do this part, otherwise, uh, no, L, and then otherwise make it, think of true as equal to one and false as equal to zero. And this is more, this is a much more nice way to write the program. If, why do we change it to false? Think about it, Sanyam. So why do we change it to false? Because next time when we read the number, we don't need to look at the if part because we have a current estimate of the max. We want to compare the current number with the estimate of the max that we have. Okay, so let's do this one thing, guys. So I think the anything, so I thought I will use a one new feature here. It will, uh, if it's going to make a mess of your lives, then let's not uh, use this. Init underscore flag is equal to one. This is what it is. If init underscore flag is equal to one, then make it equal to zero. 
So initially, when we are uh, when we set up the system, we have to bootstrap the system. That init underscore flag tells whether we are bootstrapping or not. There is this idea we can set max to very high value to bootstrap the system. That is one approach, but uh, we don't. Touch, but it is prone to errors. Yeah, to very low number, not very high number, <laughs> to a very low number. It is possible that is one approach. Shall I go ahead and compile? You're all good so far. GCC max.c. Are you all with me? I want you to understand the computational thinking part. The, what is the computational thinking part? So there are two approaches. So approach one, approach two. So let's say in, in, in one approach, our when you start the system, when you start the system, you set max to very low value, okay? So very low value. So, okay, I will just say minus uh, big number. So very low value. And then as you keep reading new numbers, so you read the first number N1, you check if N1 is greater than, uh, no, than max. And if it is uh, greater than max, then that becomes the new. So like that, you keep improving the current estimate of the max. The other approach is you take, you know, you have an initialization condition like this, where uh, you don't have an initial estimate of max, whatever the number that you read for the first time, you take it as estimate of the max and you keep improving it. So let's do this. If you want to write this in the form of a table, so let's say this is uh, uh, the value of max and uh, this is uh, Cn and this is uh, the iteration. So let's say in i is equal to zero. Uh, so I will uh, put, uh, so we don't have an estimate of max here. Let's say we read uh, the first number that we read, Cn is the current number. The first number that we read is 10. So, so what happens is uh, we have to propagate this uh, up here to 10. And let's say after that you read 20 in iteration two, you compare 20 with 10, 20 is greater than 10. So max becomes 10. In iteration i is equal to three, this is equal to minus one. You compare minus one with 20, so 20 is greater. So you just keep 20 here. In iteration four, you have, this is equal to 40. You compare uh, 40 with uh, 20 and 40 is greater than 20. So this becomes 40. This is in iteration five, you keep going like that. The problem, the bootstrapping problem is when we start, we don't have a current estimate of the max here. So that's what, there are two ways to take care of this. And we have one way is set max to an extremely low value, the lowest possible value, but it is prone to errors, but other nicer way is to do it. Do you understand this table, guys? I'm just maybe overdoing it. <laughs> OK. So now with this as the base, will you go ahead and try to solve them, the same problems which I have given? Some of you are not able to do it. 50% of the class is not able to do it. Can you go ahead and try to solve the problems? I hope uh, uh, 
you should be able to there is one more thing that i want to show which before we kind of uh, stop is uh, let's say n 20 minus 1 44 Yeah, I will share the code. I will actually use a GitHub thing. And uh, so now uh, one thing that you can do is you can use what is called as an indirection operator. And I can just say dot a dot out less than input dot text. Then you uh, know the numbers from the file will be read and the max will be given. So this way you don't keep on entering the input on the screen all the time. You can just enter it in the text and then use this redirection operator less than and then uh, it reads one uh, number at a time and it's as if the same as you enter things on the keyboard are you with me on this one this redirection this this is something you should uh, use while debugging your program so that you don't waste your time entering input all the time so when we do this thing whatever the content that is present in input dot text it will be put in the keyboard buffer it will be put in the keyboard buffer. So it is equivalent to typing the numbers. Okay, I think that's all I have for today. So today we learned how to use GDB. We have uh, looked at uh, no, uh, go to and if statements, conditional ternary operators and all these things. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it's great. So that's all I have for today. So just want to check. So are you all happy with today's lecture? Does it make sense? Interesting. You learned something new?